it's interesting. There's been a lot of research about how the body can change the brain. One of my introductions into this, and I've shared before that, you know, I had a, a mother who had Parkinson's and a dad who had Alzheimer's. So I was diving headfirst into how to help them change. And I ran into Dr. Norman Doidge's books. And the first one I read is The Brain That Changes Itself. And the other is, uh, I think it's called The Ways uh, the Brain Heals. Yeah, The Brain's Way of Healing is the second book. And what he discovered was many, many ways, he cataloged many, many stories of people that used movement to change the brain. Now, in a lot of his stories, it's repetitive movement. So it's like the body creating a new neural network and then the brain eventually accepts it. Hi, I'm Liz Larson. And I'm Bill McKenna. And together, we created the Cogno Movement System. And we'd like to welcome you to the New Life Perspectives radio show. Where we're going to be sharing with you tools, tips, and ideas that are going to change your life. Hello, hello, in UK Health Radio Land. I'm Liz Larson, and I'm here with my friend... Bill McKenna. Hey, Bill McKenna. We're the team that created the Cogna Movement System. But we're also the team that hosts the New Life Perspectives radio show here on the UK Health Radio Network. And today, I want to talk about something that um, might seem a little complicated on the surface. But we want to talk about the split brain phenomenon. Would you tell everybody what that is, Bill? Well, when he, when, um, we were talking about this episode. I thought it would um, be really interesting to talk about some of the surgeries, uh, experiments that were done trying to eliminate epilepsy. You know, the the whole thing with seizures. They had actually at the corpus callosum split the brain in two, left hemisphere, right hemisphere, actually surgically separating those hemispheres to eliminate the, uh, the epileptic seizures. But what they discovered in the process was absolutely phenomenal. You know, your left and right eye, uh, they know that they connect to both hemispheres, but predominantly they had thought that left eye connects to right brain, and right brain connects to left eye. So it's basically a crossover, right? Uh, left eye, right brain, right brain, uh, left brain, right eye, right brain, left eye. Yeah, I'm actually <laughs> having to uh, uh, verbalize this crossover. But what's the what is the significance of this? Is the the significance is that you have different centers in your brain for different functions. One of them happens to be the language area, right? And one of them is for images. Well, they set it up where they had the person, you know, look through uh, one eye and look at two images. And, and they, they literally couldn't see. And the other, other eye could see during these split brains. So they're like, oh my gosh, they can actually see, see the image only with half the brain. Now, the interesting thing is, is they couldn't visually see the other image, but they could draw 
the other image. One was a hammer and one was a uh, an actual saw. But they they could draw the saw and they could actually say what the saw was. So there is some sort of recognition from the other half of the brain. Anyway, the significance here, there are many significances, but but one of the things that um, gives us great hope, great hope, and actually, in reality, we know, even before cogno movement, we know of a phenomenon that one part of your brain or nervous system can take over for a part that's not working, right? And you have something called neuroplasticity. What is neuroplasticity? What neuroplasticity means is that you can actually change. You can actually have function in another part of the brain take over or parts of the brain actually get better, right? Kind of like your muscles, that type of thing, which is super exciting for all of us that have had, well, you know, maybe you got a concussion, maybe you got, maybe you had a stroke, maybe you had other things go on. Maybe, you know, you know that uh, there's a particular thing you have a challenge with. Well, it can get better and there's things you can do about it on multiple different levels. Now, the level that Liz and myself deal with, right, is um, we deal with it through the nervous system, through particular movements and focus. We can, we can actually be able to help utilize other parts of the brain. And, and and how we do that is really kind of interesting, right, Liz? Yeah, it's amazing. And we, uh, we want to talk about that in a minute. I want to back up before we go into that, Bill, just for everybody listening, um, just a little bit of background. What is, Bill mentioned the corpus callosum. What is it? It is this matter. It, it's a, a zone of brain matter that's in between the two hemispheres, so if you don't know, you have two hemispheres of the brain, two parts, and Bill was talking about the ability to, uh, as science has figured out, uh, medicine has figured out that you can remove one and the other side will take over the function. But there's something that in a, a normal healthy brain functions to push information back and forth from the left brain to the right brain. So it's a, a white matter that tracks uh, the connection between the left and the right brain. What's interesting about this is it also separates information in the left and the right brain. Well, how do we know this? We know through the man who was the real life Rain Man. Do you all remember the movie Rain Man? It was with Tom Cruise and uh, who was the uh, who was the Rain Man? Do you remember Bill who who played him? Oh gosh, I, I remember the uh, oh oh. You know what I do? Uh, Dustin Hoffman. Dustin Hoffman. Dustin. And it was Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman. And Dustin Hoffman was the Rain Man. Rain Man. But it was a real person, and his name was Kim Peak. Now Kim Peak was a person whose IQ, if we're going to put it that way. Um, was intellectual quotient was off the charts. And the reason was that he did not have a corpus callosum. And he literally, both sides of his brain could function independently. Now, this is weird. This is the thing that fascinated me about Kim Peek. I went down a rabbit hole uh, researching him, is that he could hold a book in his left hand and a book in his right hand, and he could read with his right eye, one book, and his left eye could read the other book and not only read them and um, understand them, but record them. Kim Peek had, you know, an what's called an eidetic memory. You know, every minute of every day was recorded. He knew if you asked him, you know, um, 
Friday the 21st, 1953, what day was it? He would know it would be, let's say it's a Wednesday. <laughs> he had that kind of an information. But what Kim Peek couldn't do was what everybody, uh, other normal pe people could do. He was what we would now call autistic in the way that he couldn't have a regular relationship. In many ways, he was childlike, except for that he had literally libraries stored in his head. So there's a lot of things that happen in the brain. The left hemisphere, you know, is about linear things and math and even color and complex symbol. And the right brain is about compassion and creation and art. But it turns out that when you remove one of them, the other part of the brain takes over. So another person that actually showed us this was a woman named Barbara Aerosmith Young. And she's the creator of the Aerosmith Institute. And she had learning problems, learning disorder. Well, for some reason, I don't remember exactly what it was, an illness or an injury, she happened to have a brain scan in which they discovered she was literally missing parts of her brain, but fully functioning. And before that, they didn't necessarily know that a person could be fully functioning with just a few learning disorders with a piece of their brain missing. So why is it so fascinating to us? Because with cognitive movement, the system that Bill and I have created, we know that we can actually get parts of the brain to take over function for another part of the brain. So we get brain injuries all the time. We get them, you know, sometimes at birth, you know, that's called cerebral palsy a lot of times, or simply we fall and bonk our head or someone drops us on our head, or we jump out of an airplane and fall on our head. <laughs> we get brain injuries. And it was thought that in the past that the brain could not regenerate and that because singular parts of the brain handle single singular issues, that once it was damaged, you're done, right? So neuroplasticity has been a huge, huge subject. I think Dr. Joe Dispenza talks about it and Bruce Lipton talks about it. We now know that that's not true. The brain does regenerate. And our research has found that you can force, for lack of a better word, another part of the brain to take over. And actually, it might be a part of the brain that's much, much more resourceful. So what we've learned is that you're not stuck with the setup that you got <laughs> at all. And that if you know how to get in and, and directly access these parts of the body, which that has been a mystery until now, directly access, but not only access, but influence, move them. Before they've used like for Parkinson's deep brain stimulation, it works for a, a, a short period of time for only some people. They just don't you know, it doesn't work for everybody. It only works for a short time because they assume this one part of the brain was responsible for tremor. Through our own athletic performance, so we know that we can help athletes change the way their brain and their nerves talk to each other, the brain and the muscles. Through that process, we discovered that some of the symptoms you might associate with a thing like Parkinson's, like maybe a tremor, that there's another part of the brain, another part of the nervous system might be very happy <laughs> to take over that function. So it's very interesting when you know that the brain has all of this amazing, amazing um, ability. We have even discovered lately how to get the brain to make its own new connections, which has been super fascinating. But we're already at our break. So Let's hear from the good folks at the UK Health Radio. And when we come back, let's talk about that, Bill. How, how can the brain make new connections? And, and what happens next? So UK Health Radio, take it away. And we're back. We are talking about um, the split brain and how fascinating the brain is and how it's really happy <laughs> and easy to make changes. So why is it, why is it that the brain is happy to make changes, Bill, the nervous system? Well, it just turns out 
that the function, it just needs to be basically encouraged, you know, and shown, shown this is how it's done. And then finding the area that is willing to take over that function. And, and it wants to be able to function correctly, right? You want the body wants to naturally go into homeostasis, right? Have yeah. everything up, running, operational. But um, we as humans, right, we tend to do the exact same things. We eat the same things. We, we have the same conversations. And we also look in the same places with our eyes. You know, all of us, if you watch a person's eyes very carefully, they'll tell stories about any whatever, their lives, and they tend to go to the exact same areas. There are areas that they won't look, or if they did look, it'll it will be so fast that they that they avoid it. And that is the area of the problem. The problem and the solution are in the same place. Turns out that your eyes and your brain and your spinal cord are one neurological system. It's one. And it is your way in to make change. You know, it's interesting. There's been a lot of research about how the body can change the brain. One of my introductions into this, and I've shared before that, you know, I had a, a mother who had Parkinson's and a dad who had Alzheimer's. So I was diving headfirst into how to help them change. And I ran into Dr. Norman Doidge's books. And the first one I read is The Brain That Changes Itself. And the other is, uh, I think it's called The Ways uh, the Brain Heals. Yeah, The Brain's Way of Healing is the second book. And what he discovered was many, many ways, he cataloged many, many stories of people that used movement to change the brain. Now, in a lot of his stories, it's repetitive movement. So it's like the body creating a new neural network, and then the brain eventually accepts it. It's exactly like um, any athlete, and this is why I say we use our athletic performance set, athletes will train in a new movement to the body. And it, a lot of times, it's not a movement that other people need to make. Like I worked with uh, these um, athletes that were on the trail to uh, uh, the Olympics who were, um, they were, volleyball, sand volleyball athletes. And they wanted to train into their body to literally dive <laughs> into the sand. You or I, our bodies don't want to let us do that because our body's like, no, you don't at high speed go face first falling. That's not good. But their bodies, they train in originally through repetitive uh, practice that that's an okay thing to do. In fact, it's, it's a good thing to do. So we know that that's possible. Uh, another big one in this field is Anat Baniel. I think that's the way her, now, her name's pronounced, the uh, uh, Anat Baniel method. And she uses movement to help the body, the brain change. The upgrade that happened with the work that Bill and I are doing is we used all that information. But then we realized there, were, there was another way in, not just repetitive movement, but having the brain connect to the neural pattern that allows that. So for example, our athletes, we find the spot in their brain through their vision, through their eyes, that will teach the body how to do that diving movement without fear and correctly instantly, about three minutes. So that becomes an instant change in the body for athletes. Well, we just kind of map that over to other things where that we know that the brain and the body are not communicating well on an issue. And we make the adjustment through two parts of the nervous system, the physical end 
and the brain side. So that's one way we, we learn to adapt what was already known about how the brain can change. So that's super interesting. But there's other things, right, Bill? Like the way the brain and body are handling a, a trauma, like a big one. Um, we, in our language, it's kind of, we say that it makes an injury to the nervous system, but it becomes a very stuck pattern. So talk to everybody about how that's possible to get the brain to move that, handle it in a more resourceful way. So the thing about trauma, right, is that you get a feeling, right? Well, maybe I got fired one time and then, and then, you know, my new job, if the boss just says, you got a minute? Whoa, right? You got a minute? No, oh, that's a bad thing. You don't want the boss talking to you, right? Oh. Or it could be a phrase, could be anything, really. If you look at it, it's so very easy to see in another person, more than ourselves, right? Because you've seen people that you know that are close to you, your husband, your wife, right? And they something just sets them off. And you're like, oh my God, that's a disproportional response. And it's not even true. Yeah. But for them, it is true. For them, that's what's true. So the thing is, is that um, once you recognize I have, you know, I got something, and here's how you recognize it. It don't feel good. I don't feel good about whatever, right? If it doesn't feel good, then what you can do is you can notice where is the trauma well guess what i've got a i've got a tightness in my chest that's where it's at there you go it's right there your nervous system creates a sensation or a feeling right yeah let me explain just a little bit more about this for people who may not uh, quite understand what we're talking about. So many of us think our trauma is a memory, right? It's here. It's in the brain. It's 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 a, 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 a something that's recorded in the brain. We don't realize that the other end of it is in the physical body. And what Bill's talking about is the end of the nervous system that tells you how you actually feel about this issue, right? Otherwise, it's just a memory like any other day. Without the feeling, it's not a trauma. It's just a memory. Well, this is actually far more resourceful <laughs> to have just a memory and not that feeling about a trauma. So let's say, for example, that that pattern of your trauma is stored in your left brain, which really does seem to manage stress in a way that's heightened. It only is a very singular focus combined with every time that particular idea comes up, you start sweating like crazy and your gut hurts, right? There's your neural pattern. Imagine, for example, you could just move that to the right brain and the right brain is much more creative. And it says, Hey, hold on a second. You know that thing you think happened? Well, actually it didn't happen that way. It looks a lot more like this. So look at it through this lens. And when you do, your logical mind goes, oh, wait a minute. And now the signal in the body calms down. In fact, it'll dissipate or disappear because now that part of the brain has given the story that that wasn't accurate. We don't even know how to feel about that because the way you were, it's not true. So a simple moving where that memory is being processed. Remember that your brain is a big old processor. It's the processor. And in your computer, your processor can be adjusted and changed and reprogrammed. Well, your brain's exactly like that. 
but you have to know both ends. Otherwise, you're exactly like the athlete who has to train in over repetition. And most of the time, you don't know where that problem lives in your brain. You're not aware of how you're feeling about it. But the system that Bill and I created allows that piece. How is your brain handling this? Where is it? And what if we allowed another part to handle? And then what's the other end? How do you feel about this? And where's your body reacting? And could we shift that signal? So now the brain and the body are talking about a new subject. And that old subject, because the system has seen that that's not really working, it just dumps that pattern and takes on the new one. So it's this really amazing and fast thing. I know that people are being like, wait a minute, if my memory is on my left side, how do you move it to my right? And is that even possible? Well, I wanna share this and I think I've shared it before. A good friend of mine, her brother actually had half his brain removed or it's not really truly half, but it is a large portion to stop epilepsy. All of his memories are still present. If the brain stores memory, how is that possible? And here's what's weird. He still feels the same way about them, <laughs> right? So the information just got transferred and moved. So we know that information can transfer and can be handled by another part of the brain. The trick is making the connection between the brain and the body. And I think you said this, Bill. It's the eyes that help us find the file in the brain. We do it all the time. We look for information in our brain where it's unconscious. But, you know, if I'm looking for something in the past, I may look up into my right. If I'm looking for something to the future, I may look up into my left. The files are there. So if you know how the eyes look when you're looking for a trauma, you can find it very quickly and move the information. It's really quite fascinating, at least I think. And maybe I'm a little biased. It is fascinating, right? And this whole thing of athletic performance, right? This is a great illustration of what we do is, is to find the efficient connection in between body and brain very, very specifically. And that's why we have people that are, you know, Olympic level athletes uh, and and ordinary people who end up accelerating to professional levels where they really, you know, for your average person, right? I like to I like to like use the the you know the basic you know analogy of the the way that people would study for you know thousands of years martial arts and they would do a movement repetitively over and over and over a thousand and times, you know, but, but it turns out we have actually seen it where when you get the appropriate connection in the brain with the appropriate parts, all of a sudden the person, their performance goes absolutely to the professional level. And it doesn't take you know, 10,000 hours. They say something, you know, his book's written like, the, you know, the 10,000 hours, you become an expert in whatever, you know, the nuances of it all. But really what it is, is, right, in order to become a, a expert, right, you have, have those neurological connections that are just, this, your body, your brain knows that circuit is firing and perfectly aligned, Right. Yeah, it's kind of an amazing thing and, it, and it's super, super fun. So it's time for us to take a break. Let's hear from the good folks at the UK Health Radio Network. UK Health, take it away. And we're back. We are talking about the brain and the split brain and how different hemispheres of the brain handle different information and memory and how they can be moved around, right? Yes. About uh, athletes, but really... Every person can change how their body moves by knowing this information. Um, for example, 
a lot of times people who have a concussion, they don't even realize it, but after a bonk on the head, which as we know, kind of interrupts our brain function, it creates a bruise a lot of times. And as that heal, the, the brain can't send energy through it. It's like having a kink in an electrical cord. So the brain and body will rewrite around it. And it does a really good job of trying to shore up all, all the pieces. But then that person from that point on a concussion might have depression. They don't even know why. Just a general malaise or funk or severe depression. They also might bump into stuff all the time. Are you a person who's bumping into things and getting bruises all the time? I worked with a woman a couple of days ago and um, we found right away that there was an issue with the way her eyes were moving. That's how we track what's going on in the brain. And she she showed me, I have a big bruise around. She said, I am running into the wall constantly. Well, she had had a concussion and she, um, her depth perception was way off, like way off. She knew the vision in one eye wasn't great, but she had no idea that her brain had stopped knowing where she was in space. Well, just with a simple, where are the eyes really not tracking well and not moving? We were able to make an adjustment, just like we do with athletes who want to change their dominant eye to the other or neutralize their dominant eye. We can do that. Where you are in space has everything to do with how equally your eyes see. She was so interesting. Once we made that adjustment, she was like, I, I right now am like so aware, like the matrix of where I, I am in space. And she just kept looking and looking like, how is this possible? <laughs> and her balance improved immediately immediately. It wasn't just that where we are in space, it's that the signals sending to the left and the right body or what creates our balance, they were off. And so her balance was off. And so it made this thing where she looked like a klutz running into stuff all the time. So what you and I've discovered, Bill, is having better balance is super resourceful to almost everyone, right? Athletes included, but you know, your average housewife too. Right. You know, um, it turns out that if you're somebody who, let's say, has a shoulder injury or knee injuries, these sorts of things that, you know, ask yourself the question, right? Have you had a concussion? This, this type of thing, you know, there are things that people just don't realize about having a concussion, first of all, you'll probably forget because it doesn't seem like much, right? You got your bell rung, maybe you played football, maybe you got in a car accident, maybe you fell off a bike and you know you hit your head or, or something fell on your head, or maybe, right? Something fell. Maybe you fell out of your bed and gave yourself a black eye. I don't know anyone who did that. Right, right. Or you fell out of a plane. And you don't even remember, wow, I never got a concussion, uh, you know, but we all deny it because it just doesn't seem like a big deal. Your brain, you can't, you maybe get a little headache, you know, you're a little fuzzy in a few days or a month, you know, you, you kind of think you're better. But the thing is, is that if you've had depression, if you've had, uh, um, let's say, problems with, you know, oh, I fell and now I got a problem with my knee, my shoulder, you know, those yeah, sorts of things. Uh, yeah. Uh, digestion issues. You know, these type of things turns out are related problems um, with frustration. If lights or sounds are too much for you, right? If you're peripheral, like you get, you get vertigo, you might look at your history and say, has this ever happened to me? Did I ever get hit in the head with a ball or something? Here's one that nobody thinks about. Braces. Ah. Braces to us, to Bill and I, it looks the same as a concussion. You're literally adjusting the bones in your face and, and your whole head. And so the, the body kind of doesn't know what to do with that. It's got to reorganize. So we learned this. And so now whenever we have somebody who have braces, when their braces get on, 
you you adjust their their brain, their vision, their nervous system. When they get t- tightened, you adjust their brain, their nervous system. My friend's child, who's very young, uh, had braces and they just got tightened. And all of a sudden her vision was way off. And so I said, well, we need to adjust her, her vision. We need to adjust her brain to allow for um, the new sensation in the, in the cranial bones is what we're talking about. So it was interesting. We did that. And when she went back to her orthodontist, he's like, wow, this change is extraordinary. You know, her body's reacting so well to braces. <laughs> no, it's not. We're making the adjustment equal to the adjustment that's being made in her in her bones. Super interesting. Another thing that we see that looks and like- this is the nerves, right? You're, this is the nervous All system, right? All of us, uh, you know, uh, our nerves go through our teeth. I know everybody knows that, but but in their physical experience, but we're not we're not thinking that way. Yeah, we think the teeth exist, you know, in a bubble on their own, but they don't. They're connected to the whole nervous system of the body, and they they really matter. That's a whole nother subject. But another thing that looks like um, this injury to the brain can be after having anesthetic can look like that. You know, uh, medicine really doesn't exactly know how anesthetic works, but they know you go unconscious. So there's a part of your brain that goes somewhere else, goes offline and discontinue, discontinues registering pain like it's supposed to. It's an interruption in those neural patterns. So, you know, they'll have people who have the same symptoms after anesthesia as, as, as though they've had a bonk on the head. And it's easily adjustable. It's easily changeable if you understand what your what that is. So braces, you know, a minor procedure, anytime that, you know, sometimes they put you out to have dental work, dental work, any kind of dental work. You want to readjust uh, the brain. Um, all kinds of little things like this that you don't think about. A major fight with someone. If you have been in a blowout with somebody, you want to reset your brain. It changes your neural pathways. So I think uh, maybe the moral of the story for us today, Bill, is that the brain and the body are in constant communication and it's in constant flux. And if you know how to expertly adjust that flux, you can adjust it in a really, really positive way where your vision gets better, your IQ goes up, you have better balance, you immediately uh, can learn better. You, your athletic performance goes up just naturally. All those kinds of things. You feel better, you kind of act better, and you literally now have control over this thing that was so um, evasive, your brain and your nervous system. So Bill and I created the thing called Cognitive Movement. And recently we readjusted what was our basic training program, all the essential things that you need to learn how to do this stuff for yourself. And you really can do it for yourself. Big problems. I still recommend having a cognitive movement practitioner, but a lot of these things, the basic moves that we teach you to do make these adjustments on their own. And so we went through and we kind of filtered out everything that wasn't needed and gave you the things that you do need to learn how to do this very, very simply for yourself. Like as though Bill and I are in your house holding your hand and it's called the Essentials Program. And right now we have the Essentials Program in a kit and the kit includes a cravings program. So everything Bill and I were just talking about and now you can change cravings on top of that once you know this basic system. So if you're interested in doing that, it's very inexpensive. Right now it's $199. It's about $100 off. Uh, Leah said it's like a 47% savings. And it's at cognocravings.com. And that's where you get the whole kit to be able to do both things, which is a real bonus. And you want to go to customize your craving kit. And you basically tell the system what you want to work on. But it's a way for people to kind of dip their toe into starting to have the ability to know how do I recognize if I've got an issue, here's a hint, 
your eyes are crazy sore in that area. <laughs> How do I then make um, a, a big adjustment in that area, right? It's about movement. And so that that's something that everybody can have for themselves if they want it. It's so cognocravings.com. So Bill, let's share a few stories. What is your favorite brain adjustment story? Oh my gosh. You know, they it's literally every every week that uh we get multiple stories, as Liz was, you know, says, you know, we we share these stories uh every few days. There's uh there's some phenomenal story, but some of my favorite stories about this neuroplasticity, this brain adjustment, is kind of the the heart wrenching stories. People are going to get a divorce, and they have kids, and this means intergenerational problems. You know the way I see it, those kids are going to grow up, and they're going to take this with them, and they'll pass it on. How did it even happen to your parents in the first place? right? If you look back in time, there's been some other error, right? Some other trauma. So we had one of them, which was a basically a woman who was uh, going to divorce her husband, three small kids, and a typical story where the husband doesn't help. And that was the big thing. And uh, and with the basic system, they had alleviated the way they felt. They went from being angry to actually recognizing and feeling their love for their husband. And everything changed. It went back to a situation where she said it was like before we were married, when we were dating even though they got three kids, but, but the comment from one of the kids that really just nearly just really choked still does now start to make a tear up here. The, the kid, keep it together, Bill. Uh, the kid said, mommy, I like how our family is now. And that was, um, that one, that one, uh, you know, there's, like I say, so many, but I love that story, Bill, and it and it breaks takes me back to something else we said earlier is that there's another part of your system, your brain, that's willing to look at it from a whole new perspective. It's actually changing your mind. You know, when you talk to somebody, you try to convince them to change their mind. It's like, you know, dealing with a toddler or a terrorist. Minds don't want to do that. But this literally changes the way the mind and body are willing to look at that situation. And that client of yours came in with one perspective and she was a hundred percent sure she was done with that marriage, done with that man. Right. And only what, probably 45 minutes to an hour later to uh, maybe 90 minutes. I don't know how long the session was, but all of a sudden her brain knows something new, a new perspective. She can see the whole thing from the light that it really truly is and her body's able to go along and accept and really feel how she really does about her marriage and her husband. It reveals the truth. And this is the thing. We so often think that our perspective is the truth. It most of the time is not. It's mostly an artifact, mostly a result of a nervous system that made a decision at one point in time and is sticking with it, right? Yeah. So if you want to know more about uh, relationships, uh, a couple of episodes back, we've got an episode on relationships. So look here on the UK Health Radio Archive or YouTube, Cogno Movement YouTube page, and look for the relationships episode. Talks about how that's really possible. You know, some of my favorite stories are about bodies that were just not moving well in a way that it, it, it really ruined their whole life. You know, not being able to move without crutches, not being able to move without the body, you know, jerking or falling down. 
and the ability to use the athletic performance uh, set that we have to teach the body very quickly a new pattern, a new way to communicate between the body and the brain, allowing the person the kind of movement that they always wanted to have. You know, we don't think about that. If we don't have a movement issue, we don't realize how detrimental not being able to move the way we want, not being able to control our own body is. And this is something that is now super attainable. If you just understand a little bit about the split brain, about how the brain communicates with the body and, and vice versa. And that is the thing that cognitive movement does. It shows the body how to, how to start communicating in a new way. And it allows the person to see that very, very clearly. Oh, here's the issue. Here's how I make the adjustment. And then, you know, for some of the big issues, you want, you want a little help with a cognitive movement practitioner. But if you're ready to get started, the very best way right now is to go to cogno, C-O-G-N-O, cravings.com and get the, get the whole kit. You might as well knock out cravings while you're at it, right? All right, you guys, we've run up against the end of uh, the clock for this episode. Thanks so much. This has been a fun episode, Bill. Certainly has. I love it. Thank you, Liz. Okay, until next time, be safe and be well, and we'll see you again next week. Thanks for being here with us on the New Life Perspective radio show. For more information or to find out more about the work that Bill and I do, please visit us at cognomovement.com or email us at info at cognomovement.com. See you again soon.